All right. Let's uh, let's get started with the uh, with Stuart's um, presentation. It's my great pleasure to introduce a uh, fellow bookseller in the ABAA who I have a great deal of regard for, known him for many years. Um, I assume you've all read his bio, which is a great read. Uh, published author, member of the Professional Autograph Dealers Association, ABAA, Manuscript Society. But did you see down the tail end of his uh, bio? He, he says, porn star, uh, authenticator. Uh, I, just, I just want you to uh, note that. Hmm? No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ellen. Th and thank you for a wonderful presentation earlier too. If you haven't seen porn stars, that's the uh, that's the uh, where they bring in uh, ephemeral or all sorts of material. That'll do it. Thank you. Everybody knows it. Good. Okay. Um, so Stuart's been collecting Vietnam for over 20 years. Um, and he mentions that in the bio, but what he doesn't tell you how deep down that rabbit hole he has gone. He has got to a level where I look at him, and Ellen, you mentioned earlier on the name Ken Rendell. Stuart is going to be the Ken Rendell with Vietnam. I mean, that's the collection. Oh, and by the way, Ken Rendell sold his collection. I believe it was $25 million, and it was to Ron Lauder. And Ron Lauder Got, the, got it out of the museum in Natick uh, in 2019, I think, and just took it out, even though the deal was that it was going to stay in Natick for a while. Anyway, I'm looking forward to Stuart's talk, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he's got to uh, tell us about Vietnam. So, Stuart, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thank you, Firmer Society, for inviting me here. Uh, this is just my contact information. I recently started a website for my collection, VietnamWarArchive.com. So a quick little thing about me. I buy, sell, authenticate, and appraise stark documents, letters, and manuscripts in New Jersey. I've been coming to the Ephemeral Society show probably for 30 years. Um, I collect the American War in Vietnam. I call it the American War because there were other wars in, the, uh, in that region. Uh, but this was the American portion. Everything I'm about to show you is from my archive. Uh, one reason why I collect is I believe that the American War in Vietnam was the most important event in American history, an influential event from 1950 to 2000. It changed our politics, it changed our military, it changed our foreign affairs, diplomacy, and uh, I think the residue of that continues today. Uh, there are many lessons to be learned from the conflict, which I will not go into now. And one of the challenges is uh, this was the ugly war, for lack of a better word, especially compared to World War II. Uh, part of my collection is to rescue materials before they are tossed out, uh, often by uh, children of soldiers. So 58,000 Americans were killed in Southeast Vietnam during the time period. Uh, it's estimated 3 million Vietnamese were killed, uh, and these are the 20 men, uh, American servicemen, who died on the day I was born. I always, whenever I speak, I always bring this up to remember them. In short, there are three basic parts of my um, collection. They're the great leaders of the war. So this is a Ho Chi Minh letter from 1946. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the Japanese were kicked out. The French came back in. Ho Chi Minh wrote to an American officer hoping to get some American influence to get the French out of um, what was called French Indochina. And this is a Lyndon Johnson letter uh, there to a uh, condolence letter to the parents of a, the wife of a serviceman killed in Southeast Asia. The second part of my collection is the American servicemen and servicewoman. So this is a in the field diary, which were very uh, hard to find. They were soldiers were discouraged from keeping diaries. This one he talks about he got mortared again last night. Uh, there are lots of photographs by soldiers taken on base, but in the field is much harder. Here, uh, an American serviceman took a photograph of another serviceman peering into one of the tunnels. I think the serviceman who took the photograph probably should have been holding his M16 instead of a camera, 
but uh, that's how this photograph got taken. There's a whole, uh, I bought the entire photo album. The third portion of my talk is the pro-war and anti-war movements here. It's a very colorful period, uh, the Nixon vampire. And this is one of my favorite pro-war uh, posters, Victory Over the Campus Kong. If anything, uh, there's actually a fourth category to my collecting, and that is anything related to Jane Fonda. <laughs> there, there's a lot of it out there. So it's frequently been said that Vietnam was the first television war, and here's a couple watching the war on their old 1960s television, which is true, but Vietnam was also the first bumper sticker war. So these are pro-war bumper stickers and anti-war bumper stickers. As a matter of fact, this one here was uh, a license plate holder. So in a lot of states, especially down south, you don't need front license plates, so you could pop on one of these backer boys ones. In addition, Vietnam was the first war after the invention of photocopying, and it made it really easy to run off materials. So uh, here are two pro uh, anti-war ones on the end and a uh, pro-war leaflet in the middle. In May 1954, the French surrendered Dien Bien Phu to the Viet Minh. This is the famous photograph of the victory there. The Americans, uh, the French parting words to the Americans were, don't get involved, which went in one ear and out the other. So this is May 1954. The earliest piece of ephemera I have related to the war was this came out in the summer of 1954. This is prevent our American boys from dying in Indochina and it's a speak out to President Eisenhower. So this is right after Dien Bien Phu, before any Americans were over there. Uh, this is the earliest thing I have ever seen in 20 years of collecting related to the war. And there's not that much more related to the war at that point. In October 1963, uh, Madame Nu, known as the Dragon Lady, who was the first lady of South Vietnam, came to, Southeast, uh, came to uh, Los Angeles uh, and there was a protest against her. So um, there's a famous photograph of the uh, self-immolating monk and uh, underneath is her famous quote or infamous quote about she'd clap her hands for another Buddhist barbecue. This trip actually probably saved her life because a few days later uh, her husband and President Diem were assassinated in the coup. So she was here in the US so that probably saved her life. But there's really not a lot of pro-war or anti-war ephemera related to the war throughout the 1950s or 1960s. By the end of 1963, only 200 Americans had been killed in Southeast Asia. And I think a lot of our focus was on a certain island 90 miles south of uh, Cuba, not something far away. But 1964 seemed to be the year of change. So at the Allentown Paper Show, I found this poster. In late 1963, LBJ gave a speech uh, about we have to uh, support our boys, back up our Americans now. So I assume this was printed in 1964. I uh, showed this to the LBJ library. They had never seen it before. They had no idea where it came from. But I assume this was printed in 1964. So in 1964, in August of 1964, was the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, which gave President Johnson unlimited uh, right to conduct war in the uh, Vietnam theater. A few weeks later was the Democratic National Convention held in Atlantic City in late August. And this is an anti-war leaflet that was distributed just a few weeks later after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution that was distributed at the Democratic National Convention, um, asking people, you know, the Democratic Party not to get involved. But again, there's really not a lot of anti-war material at this point. The first a uh, large anti-war march was in uh, 1965 in Washington, so this is a leaflet from it and a pin. By 1966, there were diverging opinions on it. Uh, Bob Hope letter here with the arrow where he talks about uh, the draft card burners and the anti-Vietnam marchers, so he was representing the pro-war side. And on the other side is a 1966 piece with a relatively early peace sign on it there. 1967, if uh, I had to ask you what decade this was from, I mean, this just screams 60s at this point. So that's the anti-war, and here's a pro-war letter from LBJ to a uh, man um, that 
uh, we're on a patient and determined course in Vietnam. So that's the pro-war side of it. Also in 1967, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, after much debate, came out against the war. And there was a uh, pamphlet that came out about it uh, called The Casualties of Vietnam. I managed to get one that was actually signed by him, which is quite rare, because he was only alive for about a year between the time he came out against the war and his assassination. By 1968, I think the split was pretty much complete. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, pro-war things. It's Jerry Rubin holding either a toy M16 or a real one with a new left is revolting. And this is a pamphlet from the uh, Grant Park uh, anti-war demonstration in Chicago at the uh, Democratic National Convention that turned into a police riot. I'm not going to really show you anything else between after 1968 because at that point the split was complete. I could keep going, but you get the idea that the country was divided at this point on the war. So to draw some larger conclusions about pro-war and anti-war artifacts, some of the ephemeris sniped at the other side. So this pro-war thing has fed up with defeatist demands. And uh, they were going to have patriotic bands and songs and the silent majority. And then you have anti-war piece sniping at the other side about the war makers in DC. I found that most of the handmade artifacts tend to be anti-war. So at the Allentown Paper Show, I found one of these sandwich boards. I'm sure there were tens of thousands of made, and everybody threw them out at the end of the presentation. And you can still see they have the little holes at the top where you could put the string to wear it around your view. So this is handmade. Uh, this also is handmade. There was a uh, well-known woman, Frances Crow, up in Northampton, who had the sign outside of her house at all times that if you wanted to come in for draft counseling, you could. This was left out in the rain for years. It was in terrible condition when I got it, so I had it restored, but uh, she hand wrote and hand painted it. Also, with, uh, if you're old enough, you remember tractor-fed paper. For anti-war paper, that people that needed a large enough sign, this actually had, was on tractor-fed paper there. So again, that's sort of handmade. I've yet to see a psychedelic pro-war poster. All the colorful stuff from that time period was pretty much all the anti-war material. Similarly, the pro-war side used classic American motifs and such, such as the eagle, God, the shield, uh, arrows, and God we trust. This was the largest, these were posters for the largest pro-war march that occurred in DC in April 4th, 1970. Occasionally things diverge. So this is a rare anti-war poster with a historic theme. So this is the famous Paul Revere uh, engraving of the Boston Massacre in 1770. So Kent State was in 1970. So this poster came out comparing the British Redcoats from the Paul Revere engraving to the National Guardsmen shooting at Kent State. So this is kind of a rare piece in terms of having classic American patriotic themes. The pro-war side generally concerned itself with POWs. Uh, this is a bracelet uh, you could wear for John McCain, who was shot down in 1967, was not released until 1973. So a lot of the pro-war ephemera and materials concern the POWs. Similarly, the anti-war side mostly concerns uh, the, with the draft, there's almost nothing from the, the anti-war side about POWs. In my search, generally the pro-war material is scarcer. This is my favorite pin uh, from the pro-war side. <clears throat> and, you know, they have, again, supporting our boys and that type of thing. But there are rarities on the anti-war side, too. So this is relatively early. This is several months before the Gulf of Tonkin. Um, so this is a uh, march in San Francisco against the war when it still was not on our American radar. And this is a 1965 anti-war uh, poster. And you can see uh, the support rests on the flag and the rifle there. Also scarce is Heartland anti-war ephemera. So this is from Indiana University. There's not a lot of stuff from the heartland about anti-war. 
and this one is from Kentucky, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Kansas University. So these are anti-war pieces. These are relatively scarce pieces to find. Another scarcity are pro-war artifacts from elite universities. There's just not a lot of material from the elite universities that is pro-war. Um, I did some research on this. I couldn't quite figure out if it's pro-war or some students were just tired of Harvard being shut down with student strikes and they just wanted to keep the school open. And if I had to pick one thing that was the rarest of all, it's American Southern anti-war ephemera. I only have maybe four or five pieces of this. This is very hard to find. So this is an anti-war uh, march, they support their boys, in, um, bring them home from Atlanta, 1967. This is a Southern Student Organizing Committee, and this is another anti-war poster from Atlanta. There is very, very little of this material out there. So by the time the war ended, I, I mean, there was definitely a cleavage in the American mind about it. But there is one thing that both sides agreed on. So here's the pro-war, no more Korea's pin, and the anti-war, no more Korea's pin, uh, since Korea ended in a stalemate. <clears throat> since I'm standing for a bunch of people who collect ephemera, these are the two dream pieces. If you ever see them, feel free to give me a call. So. In 1919, a young Vietnamese man went to Versailles, where the end of uh, World War I was being negotiated, and he handed out a leaflet. He was hoping to get the French out of Southeast Asia. It's signed by this man, Nien, and I'm not going to attempt his last name. So he passed these out, and it's about getting the French out. This young man, Nien, here, later became Ho Chi Minh. I have no idea how many of these were printed. I know the, federal, the government has one because one was handed to Secretary of State Lansing and I saw it at the National Archives. If anybody ever sees one, give me a call. The other one is uh, shortly after uh, Japan surrendered and before they signed on the USS Missouri, Ho Chi Minh uh, printed the Vietnamese Declaration of Independence. I'm sure there must be some of them out there. Um, so that's another dream piece for me. Uh, to help complete the collection, and uh, that's sort of about it. So, <laughs> anybody have questions? <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. In, in your presentation, Vietnam was one word, Vietnam was two words, and Vietnam was a hyphenated word. Can you explain? It, it just depends. I think there's no standardization. Mostly today I see it as one word. Um, even, uh, I assume if I went to Google and looked up the map of the country, it's one word. But I mean, there were just two words and hyphenated and everything else during the time period. So, that answer your question? All right. Next. The earliest piece that you showed that you have in your collection, what was that? Was that? Poster size? Is it a leaflet? Was it something? Good mailed? question. Uh, Two-page leaflet. It came to me, ripped in half. The dealer gave it to, not gave it to me, but he didn't charge me much. The restoration costs far more than the. Uh, but it, I, I think it may have been from Boston, um, and I think it was just handed out. But I, I mean, it's hard to imagine that anybody would have known that DMBN Fu in 1954 would have such ripple effects years later, and to keep that so. Professor Flory, yes? Yes, uh, yes Stuart. The uh, question I had is something I've been uh, thinking about for a while. I once had a conversation with uh, Tom Houston, who was one of the founders of the, uh, 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 what is it, uh, Young Americans for Freedom, okay. y YAF. And uh, we were wondering why there is, tends to be an abundance of left-wing material, but not so much in terms of right-wing material. And I know you t kind of touched on this in your uh, presentation. Do you have any ideas or any thoughts of, about that? Um, I think Nixon had a right with a silent majority. I think a lot of people who are pro-war may have put a yellow ribbon, you know, in their front yard or tree or whatever. And I just think it was a lot easier to 
be opposed to something and I think at universities it was really easy to go photocopy 100 whatever's leaflets off um, to just again pro-war materials just scarcer on the whole than anti-war materials so okay well thank you yep I, a very quick answer on that is why is why were there so many more anti-war demonstrations. I mean, having lived through that era, we would just say, well, do you want to go to LA or San Francisco this weekend? And those flyers and everything are made pretty much for those demonstrations. Yeah, I mean, I think there were a lot less pro-war demonstrations than anti-war, so. <clears throat> Hi, um, you showed the uh, bracelet for John McCain, but what was the story behind those bracelets? Um, I mean, I know you were sort of adopting a yeah. POW, but I don't really... So, so I have a bunch of them. I, I find them on eBay. I just used the McCain one because he was the most famous POW and probably the most famous veteran of them all. Um, after they were shot down or taken, uh, I guess, some pro-war organization sold them for money or whatever. Uh, part of the other issue is uh, in the Hanoi Hilton for several years uh, there was no ac access to the POWs. They had no idea if these guys were shot down, killed, whatever, and such. Um, I didn't bring it with me, but I do have a postcard home from a uh, American prisoner of war f who was in the Hanoi Hilton, who's still alive. He's in his 80s out in California. Um, so I don't know who made the POW bracelets. I just used the McCain one since everybody knows his name. So, other questions? Mr. Hopper. How much storage space do you have? Um, <laughs> I'm going to send you some more stuff. Uh, well, I'll say the wife's not overly happy about <laughs> the guest bedroom. Let's put it that way. Um, I mean, but paper's not. Huge. The only things I don't collect are weapons, uniforms, and helmets, so that sort of saves a lot of space. But, I mean, th there are hundreds of books and pamphlets and letters and well, such. One problem must be that this, this war is still recent enough that lots of the government side things are still classified and hardy. I worked for a professor who had a, a contract to do psychological warfare, and that's the, he t claims that he invented the idea of dropping the Queen of Spades on uh, mm -hmm. Vietnamese camps and, and of sticking them in the mouths of dead Viet Cong. Do you have any of those Queen of Space cards? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, there's a lot of the dropped ephemera because uh, uh, the U.S. dropped thousands of leaflets over you know, North Vietnam, so... I mean, those are pretty common. You can go on eBay and find them. Uh, I, I don't know that I have any of the cards, but maybe I'll, I'll look for them. So, and do, and do you save videotapes and slides and photo materials as well? Yeah, I have um, thousands of slides, which I'm slowly digitizing. Um, just for anybody who, uh, I'll just give a little public service announcement. So I have a deal with Getty Images. So I digitize all my materials and I keyword them and then I sell them online and I get a nice little revenue stream and I know there's at least one other person here who gets a revenue stream from that. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me afterwards, if you have a lot of ephemera and want to do a revenue stream, I mean, I've had stuff on CNN, the New York Times, more books than I can count. Um, you know, I just digitize a lot of it. So yes, I do digitize my slides. Uh, I have a local place. I have, I have a few films I need to take and get digitized. So, no. Yes. Uh, Stuart, do you encounter much uh, printed ephemera produced in Vietnam? Um, not really that much. Um, and I went to an exhibit a few years ago on Vietnam that uh, I lent some stuff to, and there were a lot of Zippo lighters. And I'm a little dubious about the authenticity of all the Zippo lighters, so some of the stuff that's printed there. Um, 
but I, I do have some books uh, from early from South Vietnam early in the war. Generally, it's prints on really cheap paper. I mean, the stuff's almost brittle sixty years later. So, um, so but I mean, most of the stuff I have is printed here in the U.S. or so. So. Hello. Um, so I'm not going to ask you your opinion on the war necessarily, but I do want to ask you um, how, over the years that you've been collecting this, how has this material um, influenced you, maybe from your original opinions or not, um, and also the people that you encounter along the way. Does this material, once they get exposed to it, um, does it influence them you know, in some way that's different than what they originally thought about the war? Well, I'll tell you, 30 years ago when I first started, there was nothing out there because I guess most of the servicemen who came home kept their stuff, or if they were killed in action, their parents were still alive and kept the letters, but that is no longer true. Um, I don't really have a collecting agenda. Um, I collect both sides of the war. I collect the American servicemen. Um, has anything really influenced me? Um, I don't really think so. I'll tell a brief story. Last week I met with a veteran. It was at the Battle of Dock To uh, and was going through rucksacks after the battle and found a diary kept by a Vietnamese soldier that was amazing. He showed it to me a couple years ago, completely in color. And he got in contact with the Vietnamese government and they tracked down the family and it, he was flown over last year to present back the diary to the sister soldier and fiance. She never got remarried. And there's, they, the soldier was killed uh, during the Tet Offensive. There are no photos of him, no body recovered. The only thing in existence was his diary, which was really special to see when he showed it to me a couple of years ago. So, Hi. Do you collect material related to, like, the Southeast Asia resettlement program where we were – having refugees kept at bases across the United States? No. It, okay. it pretty, and people also ask me, do I collect Woodstock or hippie stuff? And the answer is no. It has to have the V word or maybe the I word for Indochina. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't collect 60s stuff in general. It really has to All focus right. on well, I've seen kind of about, right, like the <laughs> Vietnamese that were relocated to the fort in Fort Smith, Arkansas, right? Yeah, um, I, don't, I don't have anything okay. on that. So. <clears throat> Anyone else? Thanks, Stuart. Um, I think this is an easy question. Uh, it's an easy question for me to ask, if that qualifies. <laughs> um, uh, I noticed uh, uh, you mentioned one, one organization for the Ho Chi Minh material. Um, what other public institutions, public collections, would you consult for looking for material that you may not know exists? Uh, there are a few institutions that collect at this point. Um, I believe Texas Tech has a big uh, collection, but I don't think they buy. I think they will do oral histories, and if you want to donate your materials there, they'll take that. Uh, I know the National Archives has a lot of stuff. Uh, about six or seven years ago, the National Archives, the main building in D.C., had an exhibit on the basement floor of materials f just from their holdings related to Vietnam, including an LBJ heavily edited edited condolence letter um, to a, where you could see all the edits, he was trying to get the language right. Um, in New Jersey, on the Garden State Parkway, they have uh, the only state-funded Vietnam veteran, Vietnam era um, memorial with a museum attached to it. Um, I'm trying to think, I think LaSalle in Philadelphia has a collection Okay, um, so it's it's sort of dispersed to a degree. Is so, um, but I, th I also think a lot of them don't actively go out and buy. They they're dealing with donations and stuff. Whereas actually, uh, I know some dealers are bringing me material for the Ephemera Society show, which I'll buy here. So, so. to answer your question, yeah, thank you. Okay, anybody else?
Yeah, this just slipped by me a little bit, but the LBJ letter, was that edited by LBJ or staff, or do you know? Do you know? The one I showed? Y well, I, I was just wondering, oh, well, I just heard you comment right. referring to it, and I was saying, oh, that slipped by me. Uh, where is that? And So that's at the LBJ library, but uh, the National Archives did an exhibit uh, oh, okay. six or seven years ago in the basement where they actually had a historical error. They put down that DM, President DM was assassinated on November 22nd, 1963, which was the Kennedy assassination <laughs> date. I, I couldn't believe they totally missed that. So I had to pull a security guard and you guys messed up that one. Um, but uh, I mean, the National Archives, I mean, has incredible material related to this. I'm, and as I think Bob said, I'm sure some of it's still classified and that type of material. Just the idea of him wrestling with the language if it was he. Is, is very telling, and I, I would love to see the hand uh, annotations and corrections. Yeah, I guess his secretary typed it up, and you could see all the LBJ notations on it and cross-outs, because he was trying to get the language right on a condolence letter. Wonderful. So, anybody else? Just a, just a comment. I, I sort of lived through a lot of this. I'm a little bit older than you and so forth. I remember stopping traffic at WVU. We blocked the streets to stop traffic as a protest against the war. And we were told to strike the university, don't go to classes, which I did. I did that. And I, I flunked out my first semester, <laughs> partly because of that and other, other things. And then... <laughs> 15 years later, I'm managing political campaigns, and we uplift my, one of my candidates who had been in Vietnam. And so, and, and also about uh, uh, President Dem's assassination, at the time, it was largely rumored that the United States CIA was behind that. And nobody knows for sure, of course. My point is, though, have we, have we grown? Have we changed? You know, it seems like our opinion, our attitudes become very fluid depending on the need of the day. Like, we don't stay out of foreign countries, um, et cetera. You know, and back then it was like the war was horrible. We should have never done it. And we lost 56,000 men or something, you know, and, and, and didn't win the war. You know, we sort of surrendered uh, with a lot of violent escalation from the Nixon administration and so forth. Anyway, do you think our attitudes have changed? Have we evolved in a progressive or in a positive way, I should say? Well, I'll tell you right now, I know of one vet who would argue with you with your statement that we lost. Because he's there like, we didn't lose, we withdrew with honor, and Congress cut off funding. So right there, I, I mean, it's still such a live wire, the, the entire thing. As I was telling um, uh, back there earlier, uh, I, I saw a, so YouTube came into existence, I don't know, 18 years ago or whatever, and I wanted to look up the famous video of Walter Cronkite saying, his editorial saying, you know, we can't win, we need to withdraw with honor. And the commentary underneath was, you know, Cronkite's a communist. You would thought it was 1968 still. I mean, the passions of the war just seemingly never cooled, especially for the people who lived through the period. So, so. I actually heard Jane Fonda speak at West Virginia University, and it, you know, and then you know they called her Hanoi Jane, and she caused some POWs to get their legs broken when she was flying over, and she said, "You're, you know, you're illegally here, et cetera, et cetera," and then she apologized. <laughs> it's still a hot wire if if you live through the period, it's still, you know, a live wire. So, I think you have. Hi, I, I have uh, just a comment. I have to think that every college campus where there were sit-ins and marches and rallies, including mine, um, have have material in their own archives that they kept. Um, I've never researched it, but it's it it's got to be there. They might if they decided to collect it. I mean, well, the, if there was an archivist on campus, it was collected. Um, we, we, we actually went um, down the hill from my Queens College campus and we um, leafleted the opening day at Shea Stadium at the baseball season. I do have a Mets piece uh, with, with a 
photo of Tom Seaver on there. But also even the archivist, so it, if there's anti-war protests at your college and the archivist was staunchly pro-war because his father fought in World War II, he may not collect uh, the ephemera of the time period a at that time. You know, if, if you were leafleting stuff in 1969 and the archivist was, he's there like, I don't want this junk. So, I mean, he may not have kept it, so. Well, it was their job to collect it. <laughs> Anybody else going once? All right. Thanks again. Thanks a lot. Thank <laughs> you.